Coming up on DTNS, we're at CES. We're all at CES. You are as well, because CES is virtual. We have everything from a self-docking boat to transparent OLED screens and more. Let's start. This is the Daily Tech News for Monday, January 11th, 2021 in Los Angeles. I'm Tom Merritt. And from Studio Redwood, I'm Sarah Lane. From the... Uh... In Southern California, I'm the show's producer, Roger King. <laughs> it's okay. You can, you can remember who you are later. If we're at CES. It's like that. Uh, <laughs> joining us to talk about all this stuff, Chris Ashley, host of the SMR Podcast. Good to have you back, Chris. Thank you, my friends. Welcome. And as always, coming in for CES, Peter Wells, freelance journalist. <laughs> Good to see you, too. Good to see you, Tom. Uh, oh, we were just son. actually talking about the virtual CES. Uh, we were talking about, uh, you know, how, how it's different, what we remember, what we would normally be doing if we were there in person. Uh, get that wider conversation on Good Day Internet. Before we get to the CES news, though, let's start with a few other tech things you should know. Tencent announced that Nintendo shipped 1 million Switch consoles in China since launching in the country in December of 2019. According to analysts at Nico Partners, the PlayStation 4 and Xbox One combined shipped fewer units over the same period. Nintendo expects to sell 24 million Switch consoles globally for its fiscal year ending in March. Nevada's Redwood Materials opened up its enterprise electronics recycling to all consumers. Don't have to be part of an enterprise. Until now, the company has taken old electronics and batteries from companies. Uh, their main client being Panasonic. Then they extract things like cobalt, nickel, lithium, and sell those supplies back to companies like Panasonic. Redwood Materials would like to expand that, taking in your batteries and electronics and even cables. A Recycle With Us tab has been added to redwoodmaterials.com with an email address to contact if you're interested. Baidu announced it has formed a strategic partnership with the automaker Geely to cre create an independent subsidiary focused on electric vehicle production. Geely will be responsible for actual manufacturing of the vehicles, with Baidu supplying the software and the tech stack. Baidu has been in development mode on autonomous vehicle technology for several years, launching the Apollo Go Robo Taxi service across 700 kilometers in Beijing last September. Researchers at Columbia Engineering's Creative Machines Lab have designed a robot that can predict another robot's intent, which is a capability similar to empathy. The robot was able to watch another robot move around between different colored circles and predict which circle it would go to next without knowing anything about that other robot's programming. It was correct 98 out of 100 times. PC sales are strong, according to IDC, which announced 13% growth in PC sales in 2020 over 2019. Lenovo shipped the most PCs in 2020, followed by HP, Dell, Apple, and Acer. Friday afternoon, Twitter permanently suspended the personal account of President Donald Trump for violation of its glorification of violence policy. Twitter cited two tweets, one that said, quote, American patriots will not be disrespected or treated unfairly in any way, shape or form. And another that said the president would not be going to the inauguration on January 20th. Twitter said the posts were viewed in the context of how they were, in Twitter's words, being received and interpreted on and off Twitter. None of the tweets from the account are now accessible on Twitter. Twitter also restricted the president from creating new posts on the official U.S. president account at POTUS. All right, we're not going to talk much more about that, but we are going to talk a little bit about Parler. Over the weekend, Google and Apple delisted the social network Parler from their app stores for violating app store rules. Both companies say that Parler, in their opinion, does not do enough to moderate violent content. In addition to the App Store delistings, AWS, Amazon Web Services, told Parler that it noticed, quote, a steady increase in violent content on your website, all of which violates our terms, adding, it's clear that Parler does not have an effective process to comply with the AWS terms of service. AWS terminated hosting of web services for Parler early Monday morning. Parler CEO John Matz told Fox News on Sunday, every vendor from text message services to email providers to our lawyers all ditched us too on the same day. The social network will be down indefinitely as most companies that have server capacity to host Parler have declined to do so. Parler has filed a lawsuit against AWS for violation of Section 1 of the Sherman Antitrust Act. 
they're arguing a, a type of collusion with Twitter, saying that AWS is doing this to help Twitter, and for breach of contract for failure to give 30-day notice of termination. A researcher that goes by donk underscore NB on Twitter told Gizmodo she archived 99% of posts from Parler before it went offline. She crawled URLs and was able to obtain deleted and private posts and videos that still included GPS metadata. Most social networks strip that out before they allow it to get posted. She also was able to obtain information about site admins. Uh, we've got a lot of CES stuff uh, to get to, but we we had to touch on this. It's it's a it's a huge story. Uh, and Chris, uh, I'm, I'll go to you first, real quickly. What's your take on this? So two two thoughts. One, hopefully that this situation educates people to understand that private private companies have nothing to do with uh, with freedom of speech. So hopefully, you know, the bigger this gets and people start understanding, they can do whatever they want. They own the platform until Somebody makes it a utility. Go there. Secondly, a lot of these, there are claims that the, I just think are just hilarious because on one post, the CEO said, oh, we've got all these businesses clamoring for our business, so we'll be up you know, within a week. And then right after that, he's like, nobody wants to do business with us. And you can't, it's just hilarious to me that uh, they thought this, you know, this was going to go unchecked forever. Yeah, uh, I, I was talking to some folks on Twitter over the weekend about this, uh, and really the the remedy they would have would be an antitrust lawsuit, which is what they have done. Uh, I'm not sure that this particular antitrust lawsuit has a lot of chance of validity. Uh, it'd be really hard to show that Twitter and AWS were colluding. Uh, the 30-day notice of termination, I don't know what the contract is, but there are most contracts have an out that says you don't have to give 30-day notice if you violate particular yeah, terms, yeah. and I think that's what Amazon is saying. Peter, what do you AWS. think of this? Uh, yeah, a a AWS, uh, that, that lawsuit's not going to survive at all because AWS does have um, many, many uh, claims in its uh, in its terms of service to to say that they can uh, kick you off for objectionable uh, material. So I don't think, oh, and that's penny high. Uh, I don't think that um, they're going to have much of a chance there. Um, yeah, really, really fascinating to watch uh, from an out as an outsider um, over the last week. Yeah. Uh, so I, we'll probably have time to have more to say on this. I'll probably touch on it on my editor's desk uh, this week for patrons, and I may make that available to everybody, whether you're a patron or not, because I know a lot of people have thoughts on this, but we have a lot of CES stuff to get to. So if you want to talk about it some more, join in the conversation on our Discord, which you can join by linking to a Patreon account at patreon.com slash DTNS. Coming up next, tech news from CES. <laughs> Well, LG Display loves to show off concepts. Sometimes those concepts become actual products. Sometimes it takes years, but it happens. This year's big one is a 55-inch transparent OLED panel that can be lowered down into its own cabinet. The prototype is shown sitting at the foot of a bed, looks like a hotel room, where it can rise up to view videos without blocking the view of the TV that usually hangs on a wall opposite of the bed in a hotel room anyway. So... Strange use case, but it's a way to show off the transparency of the new screen. LG Display's transparent OLED screens can achieve 40% transparency. The company says it can be moved around in a home, doesn't have to sit at the foot of the bed, that's just a use case, and might also be useful in restaurants or perhaps on public transportation. This is the first transparent OLED that LG made that's meant for the home. We've seen this kind of thing before, this is a, a product that's pretty consumer facing. It uses LG's cinematic sound OLED to produce audio from vibrations within the screen itself. That's also used on LG's other CES related prototype, which is the 48 inch flexible OLED that can be curved for gaming and then flattened for watching TV. In perhaps more mundane but practical news, LG Display will also build a 42-inch panel, which could provide a cheaper option for folks who don't need a huge screen, and then an 83-inch OLED, which is pretty big, which seems destined for LG TVs, as well as the Sony Bravia, because LG makes the Bravia screens. Yeah, that demo video where they, they showed the TV still on the wall behind the transparent, I think it was meant to show that you could see through the transparent OLED and and still see the TV it's behind. It's such a just, weird just show example, how though. It yeah, it like just, it's like yeah, it was weird because it's like what. if it's really transparent, then you're not going to be looking through a TV into another TV. Mm. It's it's just a strange. It's it, and it just looks. It, there's a weird floorboard on the bed. I don't I don't know, Chris. If, what what do you think? If so, when I first read the story, I struggled to figure out who in the 
earth is going to be using this. But the one use case that kind of hit me that I was like, you know what, could be interesting. If the screen uh, supports input, then instead of going to the restaurants and Home Depot and you see these big screen, uh, plastics, uh, you know, wall, glass walls that they have up now to, you know, to limit the uh, airflow right. uh, between you and the cashier, if mm. you could use that instead for, you know, either displaying your, your purchase or even ringing up your transaction, that would be pretty interesting. It Other than be- that, I'm not sure yet. I, every every time that um, you know some TV show does uh, future technology, they're always walking around with transparent uh, devices, like you know, and weeds and and uh, um, Westworld and things like that. And it's always struck me as like that it has to be the worst UI, uh, the worst user experience you could have. Like, I'd be constantly like missing my tap targets and things like that. I don't know. I, I, mm. If you could combine that technology with another device, say like a medical device, you could literally you have a transparent screen that like have it over a, a patient's body and it could just highlight areas of the body that you, the, the doctor or physician should be looking at. Like it's your arm. Do you have a fracture? You know, you, you scan it over. It'd be kind of cool. I mean, what's really cool is the technology, not for me, not the TV itself, but the, the technology mm-hmm. that went into it. Because if you could, if you could put it into other devices, then it becomes a lot more, uh, well, and, and 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 we're I don't want to uh, let us stray too far from the story because transparent OLEDs are not new. Uh, LG making uh, transparent OLEDs isn't new. They they've made them before. Other companies make them. Uh, what what is the CES news here is we're saying or LG Display is saying we could make these for the home, uh, and and so that's where it starts to break down because you guys are all right. Like there's great uses for this. Even the the restaurant use, when, when Sarah mentioned restaurant, I was like, oh, I could see that at like sushi shop, right? Where, you know, it can show you the different sushi things right in front of you, but you can still see through to see the sushi chef when you're, you're at the counter. I don't know that I, I need this in my house. The only thing I was thinking, because again, yeah, the bed situation, it just, it was just strange. Again, you know, it's, it's, this is not something I'm going to buy tomorrow, but I was like, yeah, I don't like the way this looks because the cabinet doesn't go away, right? You know, so you've got the screen that can come up. It's like, ooh, nice and fancy. Or it can come up partially like, okay, maybe it could be some sort of an interesting second screen for that TV that's behind you where you don't have to hold anything on your lap or, or, or you know, or, or you just kind of need a remote or whatever. But it has to go into a place. So even if you can wheel it around your house, it's like, well, now you have this sort of bulky piece of furniture, whether you're using the screen or not. I feel like we're getting somewhere. But yeah, I, I was really struggling to feel like, where would this really come in handy in my home? Yeah, at yeah, home, I, you know, maybe in the screen door. <laughs> yeah, I, I yeah. Don't, even though they, I, I don't think they mean you could wheel it around from room to room all the time. It's more like, well, you could put it somewhere else. Right, you know, it places, have yeah. to. It's not connected to the bed. But even then, like, you know, uh, sunlight getting through. Like, I don't want to put a TV in my actual window. Uh, mm-hmm. I won't be able to see any of the dark scenes. Like, I, yeah, I don't know. I don't know. It, it's good for a lot of things, I'm sure. And that's why you announced it at CES to see what people want it for. So let us know. Feedback at dailytechnewsshow.com. All right, let's talk about LG Electronics. That's the company that makes phones and TVs and such, different from LG Display. LG took the virtual CES label literally and used a virtual human named Rhea Keem to promote some of his products during its announcements. Keem wore a hoodie that said, stay punk forever, and talked about how she wished she could get back to traveling around the world, which was annoying to me because she's a virtual person. And so she is one of the few who could actually travel (laughs) wherever she wants right now. Anyway, uh, she transformed into an LG Chloe UVC robot uh, that uses UV light to disinfect surfaces and carried on with the announcement. Uh, What else was in that announcement? Well, LG showed off its rollable phone again which we learned last year at CES unrolls from a standard form factor to a tablet. Uh, The news this year is that it has a name, LG Rollable. Now, CNET's reporting that their sources say LG plans to release the phone later this year, but for now, it's officially still just a concept. LG announced a new TV soundbar in -in all-in-one designs, actually several of them, the QP5 Eclair, 11.7 inches wide with dedicated Dolby Atmos speakers and a wireless subwoofer that's coming in June or July. 
The SP7 includes tuning by Meridian and DTS Virtual X at 140 watts. And the high-end SP11, 9, and 8 models come with Google and Amazon Voice Assistance and Chromecast and AirPlay. LG also announced new OLED TVs. Top of the line Z1 series now adds a 77-inch 8K model to the one we announced last year at CES, the 888-inch one. The G1 series now includes the Evo panel. Those are panels that add a new layer of green for extra brightness. The remotes on the Z and G series now have dedicated buttons for Amazon and Google and LG voice assistants. And the C series added an 83-inch model and upgraded the processors. LG also has changed the name of its entry-level series from the B1 series to the A1 series. Uh, a few other things in the TV line, a redesigned home screen for WebOS with personalized recommendations. Option to get uh, the GC and A series with a tripod stand. And game optimizer software now has one millisecond response time, low input lag, and a lot of the models have four HDMI 2.1 ports. But speaking of games, LG confirmed that later this year, some of its TVs will support the cloud gaming services Google Stadia and NVIDIA GeForce Now. The services will come to all 2021 OLED, QNED, and NanoCell TVs with Stadia available in the second half of the year and GeForce Now to follow. Uh, Chris, I know you keep an eye on this sort of stuff. What, do you have a take on that? Yeah, so let me start with the backwards. Uh, I don't know anybody that plays Google Stadia. Not a single person in my circle. So, <laughs> I, you know, including it in, in the TV, I, I don't know what, about that. Now, the one millisecond aspect for gaming, super interesting because anything you can do to increase response time, Definitely going to allow you to, you know, be a little bit more competitive. Um, the the rest of it is uh, interesting. So I just recently started doing some more upgrades around the house, around home automation and getting more into um, Apple HomeKit and all that stuff. So I, the idea of putting the voice in the in the control in the uh, remote control, I, I don't like that. It should have built it into the TV because the one thing I I don't want is if I want to tell one of the uh, clients something i don't want to have to go pick up the remote to do it. i just want to say it you know the way it works today in in most use cases so that i think is a kind of a, a bit of a miss um but other than that the you know the, the, the tv sounds very interesting and um and uh the, the the millisecond uh the one millisecond portion of it super interesting as well but uh i'd like to see some more around home automation in these things peter yeah. what about you well, um, add me to the people who don't own a Stadia, um, but but also, um, yeah, look, I, I don't mind the the remote uh, for Google Assistant. Um, I, I know LG used to make a big deal last year about the fact that they wanted to they wanted their users to know when their device was listening to them or not, and so that that was part of their selling point was like this is a choice that you're going to make. Uh, so so I, I can kind of see where they're coming from the, from there. But yeah, no, I've got a um, I've got Google, Google Assistant built into my soundbar and it's fantastic. I would highly recommend um, getting if you've gone down that pathway of of uh, adding some more stuff. Hello, boy. Sorry, one second. <laughs> Tara, what were you going to say? Uh, so a couple things. First of all, I really want that G1 TV. Uh, I don't know exactly what the price is going to be, but we were looking at something around like $30,000 uh, for something comparable for the 88 inch. I think it was last year. So probably not happening uh, until I save up a few more coins. The other thing, and this is a little one, but the tripod stand, when you look at it on, you know, in, in the mock-ups that I've seen, I'm like, oh yeah, that's kind of, it's very, um, it's a, uh, it's trendy to kind of have those like very thin. Okay, you've got the little legs. You don't have this big old media cabinet under your TV type thing. But realistically, where is your cable management going? There's like no way that you can have a stand like that that isn't going to look like garbage unless then you like throw a vase under the tripod stand and like hide all your cables. I don't get it. Yeah. Uh, wireless, wireless HDMI, I guess. I don't know. I, I <laughs> now, the phone is on a whole different level for me. Um, the, honestly, I find that these guys are going the wrong direction when it comes to these rollable phones and these flip phones. And, you know, I, I continually look to reduce my footprint when traveling and having these devices. I, I would much rather them shrink the technology into a watch and then allow the, you know me to just carry a tablet. And, you know, and then, 
you know, before we started out with the watches being able to connect to the phone to add, um, you know, those cell services and stuff like that, they should switch it around and allow the tablets to connect to the watch to allow the cell services and then allow me to use the tablet and then, the, and then my device having these little gadgets and folding out, it's just too many areas where something can go wrong and can break. And there's more, I would there's, rather hold, hold that. that thought, Chris Ashley. There is more where that came from later in the show. All right. <laughs> it's, it's not going to get better for you as far as that goes. <laughs> well, in the smart home appliances section of CES, Samsung, always a front runner. Uh, right now, we've got a family hub fridge. Looks pretty nice. Offers a large touch screen with a cleaner UI than predecessors and the usual camera to see what's in the fridge without having to open the door. 25 watt speakers, because you know, you want to bump music out of your fridge and software for meal planning and also automated grocery ordering. But it's focused on things like meal planning, including a displayed calendar of planned meals, recipe storage, and can also provide guiding cooking instructions through its speakers. So you got to really want to use it. But if I suppose that's something that you want. That's trying to, to Samsung's trying to give it all to you. I mean, we've it's, seen this fridge a million times, right? The, what's new is the software, and I think that's actually what it needed. More more features that you don't know what to do with aren't going to sell these fridges. But telling me like, hey, it can actually help you cook. It can help you plan your meals and then order your ingredients through your groceries. All right, now you're starting to make something that's a little more compelling. Well, I, I reckon. I reckon more people have. Better bought a Google Stadia um, than have ever bought a, a smart <laughs> fridge in their lifetime. They, they, I cannot believe that they still make this product. Like, just give it up already. Like, you stick an iPad to your fridge and be done with it. Like, this is, it, it's such a pathetic, I, I don't know. I, I find them so strange, such a strange product that it, it, it's like, you know, getting a gold Apple Watch. You know, what's the point? Like, the software is going to be out of date in two years. Um, <laughs> it looks focus, so cool, Peter. Yeah. Focus on something else. I don't know. Focus on uh, getting a, a piece of glass that can be updated all the time rather than uh, an entire fridge. I will say, though, when I started playing around with the June oven back at gosh, almost a year ago for a live with it segment. And that is not a fridge, but it's an oven that has a real nice smart panel and connects to apps. And there are a lot of things that I was like, this seems a little silly, but let's give it a whirl. And I still use it every day. And I look at my oven like, God, I wish my oven had something like this. That's just a little bit more intuitive, you know, mm -hmm. with cameras and sensors. Once you have it, you're like, this isn't actually all bad. It can come in real handy. But again, you have to be dedicated to it. And if it's just going to be an expensive fridge that you don't use, then it's not worth it. You know, the one thing I would love for my kitchen um, tech-wise tech would be um, a, a barcode scanner. Just so that as I'm unloading my groceries into the pantry and, and to the fridge, I can just zap like what I've got so I know at all times what ingredients I have on hand. But that's probably the oldest, widest thing I've said uh, in a long time. <laughs> I, I think these guys continually miss the mark on some of this stuff. And uh, again, like stop trying to force everybody into your platform. I know it's where, you know, you can mm. lock people in, but people already are not up uptaking your refrigerator as, as far as I've seen. And I recently, I looked at this thing for like 7.5 seconds and I was like, no, nah, I'll just go with the regular. <laughs> uh, and honestly, I got a Samsung refrigerator and the best feature on it is the water because it goes into a, a, a container, a pitcher, as opposed to coming directly out into the glass. Best feature was the lowest tech piece of, of the whole thing. But, um, you know, if they had did something like where, you know, we can tie in your this refrigerator with, uh, you know, f food uh, calorie counting applications like, um, uh, God, what is the one that's uh, by Under Armour that Under Armour bought? Anyway, it doesn't matter. I'll think of it in a second. But uh, it, or if they tied in like, uh, you know, the refrigerator or ordering food with like one of these existing meal prep services. That can, you know, that that would have been much more compelling than, oh, yeah, we can tell you what you need. Most people don't even know how to cook. So what are you doing, you know, with, with this? You know, give <laughs> well, them the, the stuff they need. supposed to help. <laughs> well, real quick, Samsung also announced a Galaxy upcycling at home that lets people use older Galaxy smartphones as smart home devices. A software update lets users choose from functions like a baby monitor or an ambient light sensor from automatically turning on your smart lights. 
robots and the like. The JetBot 90 AI Plus robot vacuum combines LiDAR sensors with cameras using Intel on-device image recognition to identify objects down to 5 nanometers and then adjust how it cleans or avoids them. But Samsung did not stop at robot vacuums. No, sir. Samsung also showed an update to BotCare, which is a robotic assistant and companion. It was first seen at CES back in 2019. Samsung showed BotCare automatically opening up a screen for a video call. It's just one option. The company also showed off Bot Handy, meant to be an extension of you in the kitchen or the living room or anywhere else. You might need an extra hand in your home. The tall, thin, black and white robot has two large digital eyes. You might think it's cute. You might not. With a single arm that can pivot like a shoulder or an elbow or a wrist, shown picking up laundry or loading the dishwasher, setting the table, pouring wine. It moves around on a rolling base, kind of Johnny Five style. But we don't have a word on how close it is to production. So let's call this a prototype for now. I mean, it's a prototype. This is great CES stuff. It's not coming to our house anytime soon. And it looks like somebody put a giant PS5 on top of a Roomba. <laughs> Although I will say, as somebody who had a shoulder in injury, which isn't like 100%, but like it was really bad like a month ago, this, you know, I'm like, oh, yeah, all of these things sound so great. Once you actually have a any mobility issues it's not just Absolutely. like no i don't want to do my laundry it's like actually really helpful right you need somebody to pour that wine mm. <laughs> you're right <laughs> I'm injured or not i'm gonna have my vino yeah i'm good with the robot uh waking me up and staring at me with two glowing eyes i'm, I'm cool on that <laughs> yeah so, that's not gonna disconcert you at all <laughs> but by far the coolest thing that i thought was the recycling of old phones because as a guy and you know most i'm sure most people on that listen to this podcast used to buy that new hotness every single year. I got a ton of phones laying around. And recently I bought a Raspberry Raspberry Pi device to help with the home automation and being able to use a phone instead of having to go out and buy a, a, a device like that to, you know, do these type of uh, internet of things would have been fantastic to use technology. And so that that is by far the most exciting thing I've heard so far. Yeah, it's nice that you don't have to do it yourself. All right, let's get to the TCL announcements. TCL announced Next Paper, NXT Paper, an 8.88 inch tablet that uses a full color reflective display with no backlight. So it's part e ink, but it's not e ink, it's LCD. TCL claims the 1440 by 1080 display reduces eye strain, is 65% more power efficient than a traditional LCD with better contrast than e ink. Tablet runs Android 10 and also includes an 8 megapixel rear facing and 5 megapixel front facing camera, 5,500 milliamp hour battery, Wi Fi, 4G modem. The next paper ships, it has a date in April 2021 for 349 euros in Europe, Africa, the Middle East, Latin America, and Asia. Now, not a ton to say about this, but it's interesting to see an LCD that has the e paper type features to it. Uh, so you get some of those benefits of LCD, uh, but but also the power efficiency and the eye strain uh, reduction of e-paper. Interesting if they would be able to use this for like in-home learning in classes and stuff like, especially with what's going on right now. So you have the reduced, you know, just the black and white with the e-ink view. You have the camera so you can have, you know, that interaction between the, the student and the teacher. But then it's perfectly lined up to do you know, book text and stuff like that. That's where I would see something like this. And you know, it, it's kind of interesting. TCL announced its TCL wearable display will come out this year. It offers two full HD OLED displays for a 140 degree view and a small processor to run the screens, drawing power from a USB-C connection. It's designed to be worn over your regular glasses. TCL says a US bundle will include a phone and content subscription. This is just like a wearable monitor for your phone, basically. This is very cool. You know, at first when they started doing the whole Google Glasses and stuff, I, I certainly poo-pooed it with everybody else. But, you know, as, as you, you know, see other use cases, you know, museums, you know, put this little thing over top of your glasses and now you're getting extra information about the exhibits that you're looking at, um, you know, cheating on a test. You know, you're getting the answers right <laughs> on your glasses. <laughs> you know, why not? Secretly sending messages over <laughs> WhatsApp. Yeah. Right. Uh, TCL also said it will release at least five new phones this year. It announced the TCL 25G and the 20SE. Uh, the 5G runs on the new Snapdragon 690 5G, supporting sub-6 gigahertz 5G. Available in Italy now, with a broader launch in early 2021 for 299 euros. And the 20SE uses a Snapdragon 460 chipset, even cheaper, at 149 euros. 
TCL also announced the Alto R1, its first soundbar built on the wireless Roku TV ready spec. So with a TCL TV running Roku, you can hook this up much easier. Coming out later 2021. TV wise, TCL is launching its third generation mini LED backlighting. They're calling that OD0. That is named zero because there are zero millimeters between the backlight layer and the LCD panel. TCL also announced 85-inch TVs and a QLED version with 120 hertz HDMI input support and announced it will release a TV running the new Google TV operating system later this year. Any quick thoughts on the TVs? Yeah, I mean, I, I think we're going to see a lot of mini um, uh, LEDs this year, and uh, it seems like everyone that isn't LG are, are going to be saying that uh, that is going to be the the new standard, the new hotness when it comes to TV displays. Uh, so it'll be interesting to see how that actually pans out. Like wh where um, I haven't seen any pricing yet for this TCL, and it, um, I'd, I'd be really interested to see where these manufacturers are going to say. Uh, mini LED fits in that price realm. Is it going to be closer to the LCD side of things or is it going to be closer to the high-end premium uh, QLED side? And here's the thing I was telling you to hold on for, Chris Ashley. A prototype 17-inch rollable printed OLED display pulls open <laughs> like a scroll. You just, you, it's nice and compact. You just throw it in your bag like you like you would a little tube, and then you open it up. You have a 17-inch rollable <laughs> display. Uh, TCL thinks it might be useful for things like maps while you're out on a hike, uh, or might someday <laughs> be used in. Because you need a 17-inch map <laughs> on a hike. Top of map. The battery runs out. Sarah, <laughs> uh, could also be used in TVs, foldables, and commercial displays. Hey, more power to them if they could get people to use this. <laughs> um, but. Uh, again, you know, I, I could just imagine having this roll out and then all of a sudden the battery dies and you're just like, uh, yeah, we're stuck. Um, <laughs> again, I'm good. S shrinking, shrink the technology, put it in something smaller, easy to carry, and then allow me to use the tablet. I'm, I'm good. I mean, I love the idea of this. I just, and this is just because I've had so many things break. It's like anything that needs to be rolled regularly just sounds like something that's mm -hmm. going to break easily. First time you unroll it, the countdown begins. That's right. All right, let's run through some of the other interesting CES-related announcements, of which there were many. Tom, Qualcomm is up. Qualcomm announced the 3D Sonic Sensor Gen 2 in-screen ultrasonic fingerprint sensor, supposedly 50% faster than the previous version, covers 70% more area. That was the big complaint. It's now 8 millimeters by 8 millimeters, which is not quite the size of most fingerprints, but it's closer than the previous 9 by 4 millimeters. Samsung will likely include it. They've included the previous version, so the next Galaxy S21 is expected to be announced on the 14th. We'll probably see it in that. However, most Android phones use optical in-screen fingerprint readers from Synaptics or maybe Goodix. In AR land, Lenovo launched augmented reality glasses called Think Reality A3 for 3D visualization, also guided workflow. Comes as a chunky set of glasses or in more durable industrial frames, depending on what you need it for. Running a Snapdragon XR1 system on a chip and can show up to five virtual 1080p displays at once. Also has an 8 megapixel camera for streaming 1080p video, as well as a dual fisheye lens for room scale tracking. The Think Reality A3 needs to be connected to a Windows PC or a Motorola smartphone with an 800 series or better Snapdragon processor in order to, in order to run it uh, effectively. The smartphone-based model is meant for hands-free industrial uses and available in select markets worldwide in mid-2021. You know, this and the TCL announcement uh, about the wearable display make me think that we're, we're seeing a trend here, right, of uh, the wearable display as a replacement for multiple monitors. Be interesting. Um, you know, it's uh, Microsoft, once again, way, way too early to the party. But uh, it, it, in these limited use cases, I, I could definitely see some cool stuff with it for sure. Speaking of Microsoft, Microsoft announced the Surface Pro 7 Plus running on 11th gen Intel processors with optional LTE Advanced. If you get the i5 models, not available in the i7 or the i3. All the models, though, include Wi-Fi 6, Bluetooth 5, and Dolby Atmos Stereo, up to 32 gigabytes of RAM, 
and one terabyte of removable internal storage up to that. Microsoft claims battery life of up to 15 hours with fast charging capabilities that would add 80% of capacity in one hour. The i5 and i7 versions include Intel Iris Z graphics. Prices range from $899 for the base model up to $2,799 fully tricked out. Shipping starts January 15th to the U.S., followed by Canada, Australia, New Zealand, the U.K., and Europe shortly thereafter. So not quite the Surface Pro 8 everybody was kind of looking for, but, you know, an upgrade of last year's model. Um, the, probably the most interesting thing that they mentioned uh, on this uh, on this release is the fact that the hard drive will be removable. That's going to be pretty cool. Yeah, and it's a, it's the same way they've done it on other Surface uh, models in the past, right? It's, it's really easy to remove it. They also didn't reduce the bezels because uh, they say they want it to look standard to everybody else in your company that has an older Surface. <laughs> OnePlus announced the OnePlus Band, which is a low-cost fitness wearable with a 1.1-inch OLED display that offers heart rate and blood oxygen saturation monitors, fitness and sleep tracking, and a two-week battery life. Pretty good, two weeks. Other features include the 13 exercise modes, IP68 rated for water and dust resistance, with an included silicone watch strap. The OnePlus Band supports Android at launch with iOS support to be added sometime in the future, launching first in India on January 13th for 2,499 rupees, which is about 34 US dollars. A global release not announced. All right, well, sounds good. <laughs> Western, Dig get it. <laughs> Western Digital announced a line of four terabyte solid state drives. That's not four one terabyte drives. They announced an entire line of drives that have four terabytes. Starting at $680, the drives are compatible with the Xbox Series X, but don't get too excited. They don't work with Microsoft's Velocity architecture yet, meaning you can use them for the space, but you're not going to get the higher speed writing and the seamless integration. The cheapest of the four terabyte drives is the $680 My Passport with 1,050 megabyte per second read-write speed coming by the end of March. Top of the line is the $900 SanDisk Extreme Pro with 2,000 megabyte per second read-write speeds coming at the end of February. Four terabyte drives. Amazing. Yeah. Amazing. 680 is, I don't know. I mean, it's four terabytes four. is. Yeah. It's, terabyte of hotness. Yeah. <laughs> H, HP announced to, oh, go ahead. I just I, I love nerding out. That's one of the things that I miss the most about CES is just going to like the the South Hall and things like that and just nerding out at all of the weird stuff that you find down there. <laughs> I mean, I don't know. Four terabytes, it will come in handy. I, I remember an old CES where I saw a, a a gigabyte flash drive or a thumb drive, and I was like, whoa. <laughs> Oh, the first time I saw like a 512 gigabyte uh, <laughs> external drive, I was like, this is insane. I'll never use it. Yeah, yeah those were the days. Uh, HP announced two models in its Dragonfly laptop family, the Dragonfly Max and Dragonfly G2. Both laptops offer a thin and light 13.3-inch design on the 11th gen Intel processors and support up to 32 gigabytes of memory and can be optioned with 4G or 5G, also with tile trackers integrated into the WLAN module. The G2 weighs in at 2.2 pounds. The Max is a bit heavier at 2.46 pounds with Windows Hello support, also a mechanical privacy shutter. Both One come out second. in January. How about that? Right around the corner. The Dragonfly Max comes bundled with HP's new Elite, Elite rather wireless earbuds. Yeah, they also updated their their leather Envy model. Uh, if you're if you're into that, if you want to just look cool when you pull out your Envy. Um, yeah, so, until yeah. it rains, then it sucks. The 3D printing company Form Labs worked with Rio Grande and the Gemological Institute of America to develop a new version of its castable wax designed for lost wax casting, which is capable of intricate detail. So this is printing the cast that then you make the rings out of. Castable Wax 40 is 3D printable resin made up of 40% wax, letting designers create fine details in large structures like the writing on a class ring. For instance, in the announcement, Form Labs made the prediction that, quote, the next era of 3D printing won't be driven by hardware, but by materials. Pretty cool. A lot of challenges in, in uh, using wax for printing. So this is a, a pretty big advancement here. Uh, if you're a creative professional, LG would like to market to you. 
A new monitor. He announced the 31.5 inch 4K ultra fine OLED Pro monitor with individual dimming on all 8 million plus pixels. Also covers 99% of the DCI-P3 and Adobe RGB color spectrum and has a million to one contrast ratio. All right, it's CES and it's time to do a router roundup. Router roundup. TP-Link announced its first routers with support for Wi-Fi 6E, which adds the 6 gigahertz band to the existing 2.4 and 5 gigahertz connections. The Deco X96 and X76 Plus are both tri-band mesh routers. They use the 6 gigahertz band to communicate between the base stations. TP-Link's Archer AX96 and 206 are tri-band routers, but not mesh. So the 6 gigahertz band can be used by individual devices. The Deco Voice X20 is a Wi-Fi 6, not 6E, mesh router, and also a smart speaker that supports Amazon Voice. The Deco X80 5G both acts as a 5G gateway and a Wi-Fi 6 router. I've recently switched to mesh network. I'm never going back. So mm -hmm. that's the minimum is got to, <laughs> these things got to support mesh. Yeah, especially if you've got, um, uh, I've got like uh, 12 smart globes in my house. It's a very small place, so I don't really need that many. Um, but uh, yeah, once once you, your, your network gets crowded with a lot of things talking to the internet constantly, like a dripping tap, uh, then yeah, mesh is the only way to, to handle it. I've, I've had to throw out uh, a bunch of different routers that I've been testing because of that. Linksys also announced an update to its Linksys Aware system that monitors changes in Wi-Fi radio broadcasts to detect motion. The update lets it also use connected smart home products connections to increase area of coverage and also accuracy. This also lets the system report whether the motion was detected near a specific device, such as an Apple TV. The update is rolling out in the U.S. in March or April somewhere between the two, with the rest of the world in the months following. Linksys also announced a mesh router system that supports Wi-Fi 6E. This is the rage, everybody. Come in spring or summer for $499.99 for a single station. And Netgear announced its first Wi-Fi 6E router. It can deliver gigabit or faster speeds with a total throughput of 10.8 gigabits per second. That's total, not per device. It can handle 2 to 2.5 gigabits per second over wired connections. Also, it looks like a mana ray. It'll cost $599.99. Netgear also announced an unlocked version of its M5 5G mobile Wi-Fi 6 hotspot coming to North America in the first half of the year. And that is the Router Roundup. Router Roundup. <laughs> oh, the hits keep on coming, though. Hisense announced a range of laser projection TVs that claim to meet 100% of the BT2020 color standard, a key element of the broadcast 4K standard. Hisense claims that its new tri-chroma laser TVs offer 50% better color than high-end cinema, Wow, with brightness of 430 nits. Models show, uh, shown include a limited edition 100-inch 100L9 uh, Pro, a 75-inch model, and a self-rising laser TV, which unrolls from a base. Ooh. No price, no availability, but they're big and they look pretty nice. These these things look fantastic. Uh, I remember the the Hisense TVs last year that they had the same kind of projection ones and my son is yelling. Um were just incredible. The 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 screen quality was beautiful on those. Uh and yeah, I reckon Hisense actually is one of those bang for buck TVs out there. I might yeah, go yeah. for a second. Yeah, no problem, man. I appreciate it. <laughs> uh, we're great. If you're if you're having a hard time making sense at all the TV stuff, by the way, Robert Heron and Patrick Norton will be on the show tomorrow to kind of help us wrap our heads around it. Alarm.com introduced a smart doorbell that doesn't have a button. It's being pitched as COVID safe, though. Keep in mind, doorbell touching is not thought to be a common vector of transmission. However, it does mean that anybody who stands on the included doormat will be detected automatically by the device and the doorbell will ring. They don't need to press anything. There are even instructions printed on the doorbell device itself that people will be expecting to touch. They'll see the instructions. They'll be like, oh, I just need to step on the mat. Available now through installation partners for less than $200. Well, this is kind of interesting. I'm a big fan of uh, home alarm systems uh, that you install. I, I think they could have just went with a gesture. And that would have been perfect instead of adding another device to it and probably would have been able to bring that cost down. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, interesting nonetheless. You know, I, I, you know, even though, yeah, COVID's probably not going to spread through it. I don't, you know, yeah, I, I clean my doorbell on a regular basis because people are touching it. <laughs> yeah, it's true. I feel a lot of people feel the same way as you do, for sure. <laughs> 
Volvo subsidiary Penta announced its autonomous boat docking system is now commercially available. The integrated assist docking takes into account winds and tide, along with data from GPS and onboard sensors. The boat's pilot just points the stick in the general direction of where they want to dock, and it's supposed to do the rest. The feature will be available this spring for existing Volvo Penta motor yachts between 35 and 120 feet. Oh, my motor yacht is yet in that range. I'm, yeah. yeah, my yacht is like slightly smaller than that. Yeah, Too mine's bad. zero feet. How long is yours? <laughs> mine's <laughs> negative 50. It's just a pipe dream, really. Uh, no, this is really cool. Uh, all jokes aside, this is this is this is difficult, way more difficult than than some of the other automation uh, that's been done for cars. So uh, good stuff. And uh, Chamber. Good. Oh you'll yeah, go ahead, Chris. Come down to rafts and you know blow up boats, and then we'll all be able to play. <laughs> <laughs> and trickle down. <laughs> Chamberlain built a smart dog door called the MyQ Pet Portal with two 1080p cameras, infrared and light touch safety sensors, microphones and speakers, connecting to a Bluetooth low energy beacon for a dog collar. Door opens after a few seconds of your pet sitting there asking nicely and then seals and locks when it's not in use. Pre-orders start today for a mere $3,000. Now, the price is ludicrous, but I got to say, and listen, I've seen enough TikTok videos to know that a pet pig could also take <laughs> advantage of this. True. You know, people got monkeys and raccoons living in their homes now, but <laughs> sure. the whole idea of having a doggy door or an animal, you know, a pet door in general that is smart enough to allow your pet to go in and out, to give you a lot of ideas of when that's happening, and to also not be this, like, kind of hole in your wall the rest of the time mm. where you don't want a possum, you know, just kind of coming in and sniffing yeah. around your house when you're not around. If the price came down, I would want this very much. I loved every word of this until you got the <laughs> price. <laughs> yep. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, th this is going to be that thing that, um, you know, Sony and uh, Samsung are going to be looking at themselves saying, we spent all this money and all anyone is talking about is that doggy door <laughs> because it's just, it's just going to make great TV. It's going to look cute. But yeah, three grand. What the hell? <laughs> Lutron announced the IP65 rated Casita outdoor smart plug certified to withstand heavy rain, also snow and dust and temperatures from negative four to 140 degrees Fahrenheit, so big range there. Integrates with Lutron's app, Amazon, HomeKit, Google Assistant, and Ring devices. Comes out in late March for $80. Super interested in that because uh, I'm an Insteon guy and they mm -hmm. haven't added a new device in years. So I've been looking for possible replacements if I need to replace something. And uh, this uh, Casita uh, line uh, is one that's available with HomeKit. Uh, so, yeah, super interested in that for my shed. Uh, and then last bit of CES news for today, Moen announced a remote sump pump monitor. Connects to your existing sump pump and tracks water levels, performance, power loss, humidity, temperature, leaks, and Wi-Fi status, and then sends your phone an alert if it checks any problems with any of that. Launches in the second half of 2021. Very slick. All right, let's check in with what's happening in the UK with Nate Langson. Thanks, guys, and Happy New Year. What a year last year was. I'm sure this year will be better. And to start the year off in a good way, I have deleted WhatsApp completely, fully. And, well, it caused an argument, let's say. And you can hear part of that argument that I have with my brother, who also happens to be a technology journalist, on this week's text message. That's episode 226. Be great to have you on board as a listener this year, and you can get started by going to uktechshow.com and listening to our latest episode. Thank All you, the Nate. Family, those Langsons. Hey, if you have feedback, uh, anything that we talked about today, anything that you might be monitoring at CES that you want to talk about with us, Questions, comments, all that good stuff. Feedback at dailytechnewsshow.com is where to send those emails. We'd like to shout out patrons at our master and grandmaster levels. Today they include Dustin Campbell, Andrew Bradley, and Brad. Just Brad. Also, thanks to Chris Ashley for being with us today. Chris, where, where can people find your work? Oh, you can definitely come check us out. Me and the homies on SMR Podcast. We record every single week that we can. Um, have a great time talking tech, get a little personal sometimes. You, you never know what you can hear. You can hear how to make a new cutting board, how to cook a brisket, or you can hear some interesting conversation around tech. So come <laughs> check us out. It, tr it truly is. It's the podcast that does it all. Uh, one of my favorites. Also, thanks to Peter Wells. Peter, where can people keep up with your work? 
Uh, yeah, so you head on over to the helpdesk.com.au. Uh, that is a daily tech podcast, funnily enough, but it is more of an Australian bent, obviously. Um, and But quite often, most of the stories are still coming out of the States. We just take an outsider view of it. Go check it out. Look, with with uh, text message, the help desk, SMR podcast of this show, you'll cover it all, my friends. Uh, if you need a little more explanation, though, on tech topics in particular, if you're like, what is Wi-Fi 6E? How does this 5G stuff work? I've, I've been hearing a lot about Section 230. Uh, go find out our related show, Know a Little More, at knowalittlemore.com. We're live Monday through Friday at 4.30 p.m. Eastern, 21.30 UTC. There's a lot more CES to come, so we're going to be back at it tomorrow. Find out more at dailytechnewsshow.com slash live if you'd like to join us live. Back tomorrow with Robert Heron and Patrick Norton. Talk to you then. This show is part of the Frog Pants Network. Get more at frogpants.com. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs>